there are a number of states now that have turned around um, their prison uh, trajectory, their prison population trajectory, um, downward, or, or at least stop rising. Because, I mean, the states were worried because despite this massive drop in crime that was being experienced nationally, they were not getting a dividend in a reduction in prison costs and their prison populations were continuing to rise. And that, in great part, was what made them, in some ways, easy fodder for the reinvestment initiative, Um, which started, I'll tell you, other than in the first state in Connecticut, really in the most conservative states in the country, Kansas, Texas, Arizona, Louisiana, etc., because those states, it, it was not a political question anymore. It had become a serious budgetary issue. Well, there were two, I guess you would call them, um, yeah, recession moments. And the first one was when we first created the initiative um, in early, I think it was, what what was it, 2002, um, 2003. um, And, in fact, designed the initiative to be able to, in fact, to operate without depending on new uh, financing. That is, the whole idea was that no states had money, new money to invest in anything. And what we had to do was think about ways in which existing dollars could be reoriented, recast, reframed, repooled, and reinvested, right? That was the mantra. And so that's why we connected all these things to, to current correctional spending for particular places and said, look, if these can be reduced, et cetera, et cetera. That made it uh, much, and that has been a fertile ground. So that, that happened first in, in early 2000, but it's just, and, be, and really took off again in the second recession that we've just, you know, been experiencing. So in fact, yes, it's, that's one of the reasons reinvestment um, continues to uh, sustain itself as a, as a movement um, because it is in fact in great part oriented towards financial hard times. Um, so I was actually getting to what is, what is more the larger obstacle has been in helping to uh, having a really persuasive way of targeting what reinvestments actually happen. Um, the majority of reinvestment that has sort of been going on as a result of this has been to reinvest in local correctional um, programs, whether that means drug treatment or, uh, you know, community probation, uh, et cetera, it has been primarily in that arena. It has not been sort of into the more civil society institutions, which we've been trying to get at, um, like uh, school systems and health systems and so on. Um, So the biggest block right now has been that, that it's just, it's hard to stretch that money beyond a reinvestment in local correctional approaches that, you know, still, uh, albeit, to, you know, um, not civil society investments, are still being invested in ways to continue to reduce the overuse of prisons, right? So to continue to not only reduce the prison population, but generate more savings for reinvestment. Um, so, yeah, it's still tough. I mean, there's no way that uh, that the you know primary sort of crime conversation um, has been eclipsed in any way by all these developments. And in fact, you know, I'll tell you that I think much of this um, was much of this rethinking, this perspective, at least among government, um, was helped by the reentry movement. And I, you know, it's hard to remember now. And again, OSI was heavily involved in this. But in 2000, uh, no one was talking about reentry. You know, it was it was not a conversation that, that was happening at all. Um, and over the, the the following ten years, you know, it became you know every single state has reentry task forces, thinks about reentry plans for re- is doing something about reentry because it be- and that was a community focused issue. It said, look, people are coming back to our neighborhoods. What are we doing about it? Are they any more, more prepared? Are they more damaged? What are they doing to the neighborhood? And so our mapping and the reinvestment initiative all sort of coalesced around this reframing of the question away from the more abstract, you know, um, if not progressive questions of, you know, race, uh, questions of individual punishment, et cetera, to what's actually happening to neighborhoods. And to start to understand that um, far from uh, just being a response, the phenomenon of 
um, hyper-incarceration in particular neighborhoods is now itself um, a, a problematic condition, uh, a condition of distress in those neighborhoods just because of the sheer um, difficulty of the breaking of ties and the, and the reestablishment of connections coming back, the downward mobility of the prison experience, then concentrated into parenting-aged men all coming back to the same neighborhoods. Um, you can see what we're trying. That's the sort of picture we're trying to flesh out so that the responses, we don't have a response. We, our, our, our work has not said, here are the three things you do. Um, even though the, the, the Justice Reinvestment Initiative does actually do that um, state by state and project by project. But the general picture suggests that what has to be done is in, in some ways, and, you know, it comes back down to it, um, an inside-out result. You have to devolve decision-making and finances back to local areas so that they can, uh, they can make the best of it. I mean, the example in Deschutes, Oregon, was what really inspired us because – um, what Deschutes did is they took those dollars that the state offered, and they didn't just invest it in um, new correctional programs, even though they did. They turned, they turned their juvenile justice program and their probation program into a community-centered program, moved their offices into the toughest apartment house, etc. But they also invested some of their dollars in pre-K education and home nurse visitation programming, right, because they wanted to add sort of uh, – um, develop, you know, more of the civil infrastructure um, in these neighborhoods where in the big picture, you guys, what we're seeing is that, again, not necessarily intentionally, but systematically, weak civil institutions like schools, healthcare care systems, uh, uh, vocational pathways are trying to be made up for, um, at least in terms of the public safety angle, by more criminal justice. So weak civil institutions more criminal justice institutional involvement. And the problem is it doesn't work. More criminal justice does not create more safety. Uh, again, a mythology that's difficult to, to break um, in the public eye, but one we're trying to break by bringing it down to these geographies where you, anyone you know, who thinks about it for too long realizes a safe neighborhood isn't safe because of jails and police. It's safe because of great schools and uh, you know, good connections, access to um, vocational opportunities, et cetera, et cetera.